that was getting anything. Connected to them now. And this is just music for backup, and it's on Max for voice. It's three minutes till it starts. Oh, three fifty-seven. They haven't even. I don't know how timely they're going to be anyway. Good afternoon, callers. If you could please mute your phones, we'd appreciate Peter, it. You look like you're in witness protection with the backlighting out of your windows. There, yeah, that's better. Jack <clears throat> Rossi. <clears throat> Hello, how are you? I'm glad it's Friday. <laughs> Isn't every day Friday for you? Oh, no. no. You're retired. Don't rub it in. Don't get me started. <laughs> we are recording and we are live. Okay. Yeah, I see Carrie Smith. I just lost Rita. Yeah, hopefully she'll come back here soon. We lost her as well. Hello, Scott Blair. Hello, Randy Collins. Um, Darcy Arjay. Bars. Bars. And there's Peter Watts. Peter and Carrie have the light behind them, don't they? Yeah. Peter is the most angelic. International Man of History. There we go, Peter. All right. And just a second here, we're waiting for one more we'll print off here. Oh. We'll be able to go over there. I'll be right there now. Hello, oh, Chief. How's it going? Good. 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 Turn the camera 
call the August 13th, 2021 special city council agenda for the city of Gerhardt to order. Um, we are doing a hybrid uh, in person with masks and uh, via Zoom tonight. And is there any declaration of conflict of interest amongst the uh, city council? No. Nope. No conflicts? No. <clears throat> nope. And old business, uh, Chad, do you want to go through the fire and police station survey results and geotech report? I do that in there. And just uh, take a few seconds here to make sure that I can log in, give you information. And then I want to check with Christy. Everyone was supposed to uh, reuse their survey stuff. Yeah, and I've got it on here online also. I'm just trying to make sure that I can share a screen. Oh, can you? Uh, find out in just a couple seconds here. Yeah, you're on there. Yes, that's good. And yeah. that, and I'm able to share my desktop. It's okay. Thank you very much, Madam Mayor and Councilors. Uh, currently, what I have here is the fire station survey results. This was on the agenda for the last city council meeting, but we ran out of time. But I think it's prudent to have it. Uh, this should be in your, your packets from last that you have, but I have it up on screen here uh, for those that don't. So this summary uh, sheet with the statistics is interesting. So we had a total of 554 respondents. And you see the period uh, was from June 25th to 8 one just over a month. And uh, again, by comparison, the 2019 survey was open for three months and we received 947 responses. Uh, there was also a door-to-door -door effort on that first uh, survey that came in. So it looks like one of the interesting things is 455 of the 554 were all online. So that was a really good turnout online. We were actually surprised by that. Uh, we did remove 14, 11 were duplicates and three of them were anonymous. Uh, and again, as of as the 1600 paper surveys, 99 of them were on paper. Uh, and then we just had one of those uh, removed for incomplete information, you know, unable to submit points. So we had some comments which were included. Uh, let's see, one was received after the survey closed, so we did not keep that. Eight mail were returned, which is pretty good for that amount, and 15 mail were returned as temporarily away, not resent. So it shows. Here, are you a Gearheart homeowner, renter, or business owner? And uh, obviously, homeowners were 97% of the category. Are you registered to vote in Gearheart? And of the respondents, 56% said yes, 43 no. Do you agree with the city's plan? Now, this is of the entire group. Uh, 554, 64.4% said yes, and 35.5% said no. They did not agree uh, to put the fire police station up in your Highlands Lane in one one Would you support the necessary bond financing? 40.4% said no, and almost 60% said yes. So the voters, it was close. Yes to both location and the bond was 50 for 51%. And of the non-voters, it was more of a one it's 70% yes to vote. And then after that, in this, uh, we had non-voters. All the information that we provided to uh, the residents for that survey. 
We, uh, again, we talked about how many copies. We, uh, as far as recommendations go, based on this small amount of uh, surveys, city staff would uh, find the results favorable and recommend moving forward uh, with the November bond measure. Resolution 964, which we'll talk about in a little bit. So, with that, and as we get a chance to take a look at it, any questions about the survey itself? Um, my one question is are the voters, is there about 1,500 voters? I think that the total voters are over 1,600. 1,600 voters. Okay. Like I thought that was our about our population, so our population must be north of 2,000 then? Probably. Uh, one of the issues that we have is that the you know census has been a little bit off, and some people who do live here, you know, who could vote don't, or they're, they're already uh, you know, registered to vote before them. And that. Yeah, the, uh, we're going to see a climate. This next census is going to be very interesting wow. for us. Should set the stage for all sorts of different things that move forward, uh, you know, especially since you know, the build of the lands and the tour and all that will change based on a lot of that. Yeah. So, counselors online, do you have any other questions about the survey? No, nope, pretty straightforward. Nope. Okay. As far as the, uh, the geotech report goes, I'm just going to paraphrase you know, a lot of the information I've, I've talked to, I think, all of you about the geotech report. Uh, there is a difference uh, between what we were looking at at the Highland site, or excuse me, the High Point site, and then we're going to call this for now the, the fire police station at Cottages at Gearheart. The difference, one of the main differences is, and this is also according to our local geologist, and the geologist that was working on this, is that this new dune that we're working on is at approximately 2,000 plus years older than the one on the ocean front side. Obviously, the ocean was a little farther up back then, and this dune formed quite some time ago. And what that did is it helped within the makeup of the dune. The soils reports and all that came back very positive. On the first dune, when we were looking at High Point, the Murphy property, we were looking at a uh, system for the foundation that would have included uh, something like piles or stone columns, retaining walls. And that was for a couple of reasons. The width of the dune was part of it, but also the makeup of the soils. Once we had that uh, geotech report uh, for the high point site, we then looked at this site, hired a company, a geotech, a different geotech firm to take a look at this site. And they did. And then they also compared it to the information from the first geotech report just to see what the differences would be. And what we found is we were pleasantly surprised. This older dune is in better shape, much better to build a building such as this uh, resilient police fire station. The need, because of the width of the dune and the soil's makeup, the need for uh, the more difficult types of foundation uh, went away. We could do more of a, uh, a typical type building foundation that's still built under critical infrastructure or the state building code. Uh, uh, with that in mind, um, you know, it's still going to be a thick foundation that we're building, but it can be more typical uh, to spread a footing and a path. So that saved us a little bit of money on the entire construction process. The, and we'll talk more about the cost here in a little bit. So essentially, the first 10 feet of that dune will need to be removed and compacted where the building is located. And that's essentially digging out the foundation area, wetting down and working with the sand, and then putting it back in, in lips. And, and uh, that's where they also uh, compact it. But after that 10 feet, when we get down farther, we get to medium dense and, and uh, very dense sand dune, which is very good for building. The other 
thing we took a look at was they went down approximately 64, 65 feet. And there they just began to get into the aquifer. So the top of this dune is on an average right now about 70 feet, 68 to 70 feet. When they got down to the 64, 65 range, they started getting into the aquifer where there were some damp soils. Uh, what they took from that is that the aquifer was just slightly below that. And at least gave us approximately 60 feet of clear sand that was not wet. Now, looking at uh, and talking to geologists, when you can get 30 feet of sand on top of an aquifer, your probability of liquefaction goes almost to zero. Because of our distance from the aquifer and, and to the uh, top of this dune, liquefaction is not being considered in the site. I liken it to having a bucket of sand when you go to the beach. You fill that bucket halfway full of sand and you fill the waters with ocean water right up to about the level of that sand. And if you shake it, that sand is going to flatten out. And that's liquefaction. If you add another three or four inches on top of that and shake that same bucket of water with that sand in it, there is a lot less, if any, movement because the pressure of the sand is keeping that liquefaction from happening. So taking the type of earthquake, which could be very large for a Cascadian zone of earthquake, taking these things into consideration, the liquefaction is very low. So the geotech report shows that this is a very good place to build a fire police station. This is one of the few places that is like this. There is really no other piece of land near or within your heart that is anything like this, except for potentially some of the homes that are in the Pine, uh, Pine Ridge Drive area. That would make a fine fire uh, police station location, but then we would be down to uh, uh, buying some people out of their home and putting it in there. So as far as availability and its location, this is a really good place, both for access and for uh, geology reasons, geologic reasons. So that's the basics on the geotech report. We're very happy with that. Is there any questions about the geotech report itself? Okay. So that being said, uh, we're kind of finished with the old business portion of things. And now we have pricing. Uh, this has just been done very recently. The pricing is in the portion of the packet of the very large pages. And give me a moment, I'm going to pull this up so people can see it. Is it under the memo for general obligation? No, it's uh, I've got it on a 11 by 17 or sheet. It's this one here. Project budget sheet. Yes. There are two sheets there. One of them is go past the maps here really quick. <laughs> That pricing sheet, I'm having a hard time finding. It this is really a lot of squawk on this thing, isn't it? Pull it up a different way. Chad, under supporting documents might be where you're looking. Thank you. I'll find the documents. Check reports, lands, mapping, station pricing budgets. There we are. So I'll show that. All right. So this worksheet that we have, there's two different worksheets. One of them is based just on the construction of the building itself and the roadways. And then the other, uh, which is one with the red writing on it, is your heart resiliency station statement of probable costs. That's where I'd like to start. So we break up, broke things out. And this is based on other fire stations that have been constructed. 
This is based on the location of the building. This is uh, uh, based on a lot of uh, other history of cost um, comparisons. We use two different cost companies now. The first one was at the High Point Station site, which was ACC, and now this company, which is Construction Focus. The benefit of doing two different companies on two different sites, I'll, I'll give you that, but the construction costs were very similar uh, to uh, each other. So that kind of showed that at least we're on the right track. So we spent a lot of time drilling down. We got a fire station on line one, and I'm gonna to get to this for the public here, right there. This is the statement of probable cost. The fire station on line was approximately 13,200 feet, and that's based on a program to include a fire station that is more adequate for our volunteers uh, that we'll, we'll be able to grow into for the near future and also provide a police station as well. That program includes everything with the bathrooms, the locker rooms, the evidence storage, and it also includes the apparatus, you know, for the for the vehicles. So at 13,200 square feet, we are anticipating the cost to be approximately 335 feet per square foot, which is more expensive than your typical house per square foot. And the reason for that is this station is going to be built as a uh, critical infrastructure. So the cost for a critical infrastructure building is much higher because it's built to a higher level to withstand earthquake. The uh, building itself will have larger timbers such as that thicker walls and uh, more tie down straps, things such as that. This will be a wood frame structure, two floors. Can I just interject? What is the yeah. average cost of a with a house per square? There's no average. No average. I mean, I, I don't work. I work at the very upper end, so the one I'm building right now is five hundred and fifty dollars per foot or something. Okay. So that, that's not. That wouldn't be a normal home. Got it. Okay. Mm -hmm. But you know, normal homes uh, are not built with this thickness. And then there's also part of this is you know a lot of the square footage is going to be in a large area for the truck bays, five bays. So there's an offset with that that is not quite as expensive as uh, the other pieces. But this is built to critical infrastructure standards with larger uh, wood beams, timbers, and such. The next line for thirty-five thousand is declaring the rub. Uh, the area, and that's removal of some of the smaller trees and brush. There are some larger trees on the east side uh, that we do not have any desire to take down. Uh, and I don't think we have any, there may be some tree removal needed for the access points, but um, we're gonna be able to keep uh, most of those larger trees, but most of the small, very small brush pine that are on the site will be taken out. Earthwork, uh, the excavation, cut and fill is on there for about 154,000. We have uh, asphalt paving, uh, about 26,000 square feet for 195. Sidewalks, approximately 13,000. Site improvements, this is all the extra little things that go around the building, such as this, such as garbage enclosures. Bike rack striping, sizing, or uh, excuse me, signage, uh, and all the things that go on the outside of the building. Uh, a, we have budgeted up to seventy-five thousand. Landscaping is something that to keep it residential in its nature, to be able to surround it uh, with uh, trees and things. Uh, we're looking at about a hundred thousand uh, dollars. Eleven years ago. Uh, well, excuse me, more like 10 years ago, we spent about 50000 on the uh, water treatment facility. And that 50000 was donated to the city of your heart. That also includes an irrigation system to keep things uh, growing. Open area helicopter use. We're not going for that right now. That's one of the things that we had to set aside for now. But we also think that it will not be uh, as difficult uh, to do. Uh, open area, grassy areas is something that we want to plan for in the future, but we did take that up for now. 
site remediation, that's that densification of loose sand for the geotech report. That's what I was talking about, bringing out the first 10 feet, putting it back in, in separate lifts, and, uh, and then the compacting it down. We have two roads that are shown on the maps uh, that we provided online. The two roads, we have the East Vehicular Access Road, which goes east to Highway 101. It's the driveway that will help us reach that. That's why we're setting aside 281,200. That does not include any of the wetland credits. That's in a separate line item. And that's in order to remediate the wetlands and, and offer uh, credit money to be used in other wetlands to enhance them. But it does include uh, the culvert work that would need to go into this area. And I have taken a couple of different companies up there to look at that site uh, in regards to its access point. And it, it is doable. It is doable. North vehicular access road. This is the road that goes directly north along the back of the new proposed possible uh, uh, organization, or excuse me, yeah, uh, residential area. This will give us a secondary means of egress for the fire station, which is prudent when you're looking at a resilient type station, you want to have at least two ways in and out. And currently, as we talked about earlier, we have two ways in and out of our current fire station heading east and west. So that's a, a road with drainage, compacted, built, maybe some uh, retainage, retaining walls, and that are included in that. It's a little bit longer, so it's a little bit more expensive. So that can't just be gravel? Uh, it could be just gravel, I suppose. Sure. Um, depends on the slope and all of that. But again, we're building it uh, to be the, the access and the building itself. We're trying to build as, as well as we can. Uh, this isn't going to be a Taj Mahal at all. This is going to be a basic fire station with the basic needs of the fire department. Nothing fancy inside, but the, the money spent outside for these sorts of things, um, we're, we were planning on building robustly. Any reason why you're choosing the northern route versus the south to west route? That is a good point. And that's something Councillor Brad Warren brought up as well. And uh, why not? That's a possibility. Uh, down below, you'll see an alternate, including markups, and for public, I'll bring that down. We show that that would be as an alternate about $513,000 to build. And I'm sorry, that's on that sheet. Is that that V? It looks like a blue V. Correct. So part of it is where the vehicles would go up, and then we also show kind of a trail sidewalk that would lead from the park area or that area there up into <clears throat> fire station site. And what Councillor Warren found was that the agreement didn't specify uh, either one. So what we did is put in the agreement that we have an option to look at both and choose one of those. So it is an alternate. But there isn't much of a difference between the two. And that will depend on uh, negotiations with the uh, development company as well uh, on, on how this would best go. The bringing the fire station through a neighborhood was something we were avoiding, uh, as well as getting access to the neighborhood because if, if the neighborhood had access to like that, then it would change the access to the east but is potentially being, uh, hold on just a moment here. Looks like when you have, Chrissy, if you can get that for me. Uh, so it would change, the, so the east is considered, the east access is considered a driveway. It's for the use of the fire department. Trucks in and out and volunteers in and out and some of the public, but it's not considered a thoroughfare to access the neighborhood behind it. And that enables us, and, and, and if we did it this way, then ODOT can do it pretty well administratively to allow us access to Highway 101. 
If we were to put in some kind of thoroughfare for a, a third access into the neighborhood, that would allow them to use that, and that would change things quite a bit. And we'd have to do some access controls in that uh, to be able to do this because it would increase traffic density potentially. But that being said, we have the options, Madam Mayor. We can, as we go through the design process and the negotiations with the developers, we can make a decision in the future. We put the more expensive route into this, but it isn't much, of, or excuse me, the less expensive route, but we like the northern access as far as uh, how it worked with the fire station. Dad, could you please uh, share that plat mat with the different uh, ingress, egress options? Will do. <clears throat> Thank you very much. I'm going to double check here. This one's better to look at. Let's try to get the screen a little bit bigger. And let's see if this works. So this here. Is that coming up on the screen? No. Okay. So the fire station. The the highway is up on the left hand side, Highway 101. And I'll bring it down a little bit so you can see that label. The neighborhood is on the left hand side or the west side. This gray bar in the dotted box is the access off of Highway 101 into this site. So there's a good grade change there, but it's within reason. It will need to be built. So that gets us into where the trucks and apparatus are into the parking areas. The access that so far we're talking about that we prefer to this point, the secondary access would be moving north along the neighborhood behind these homes. And this isn't exactly how we do it, but we're just showing you know, what the possibility was. There's one way or the other that that road would connect into Highlands Lane, you see at the top of this uh, page. It may be through that last portion of the neighborhood, or we may be able to engineer it so it just comes out closer on the Highlands Lane, but we want to, we, we haven't gotten down to the brass tacks on this. But again, it's doable and uh, gives us some options. The, the other option is this purple area on the left-hand side, on the bottom part of the page, that shows an alternative access that goes all the way through the neighborhood and then up into this drive area uh, into the back. So with the way that the agreement, we'll go into that here in a little bit, was written, is that we have options. I thought originally when we were talking about this, that we were talking about an alternative to Highlands Lane only if we couldn't do uh, the 101. Uh, on a timely basis, let's say. Uh, it, it's been our desire to make sure that we have the secondary means of egress. You know, we like it into firefighting, and the chief will, you know, uh, back this up. But when the firefighters go up onto a roof to put out a uh, chimney fire or something like that, we put up one ladder, and then another crew puts up another just in case something happens. So that if something happens to our first ladder, it falls or there's a burnout or something in that area, we can go ahead and then escape and get off on the other location. It's the same kind of thinking that we're having here. Is that is this a luxury? I'm not so sure. The secondary means of egress, if there was a tsunami, how the flooding would actually uh, happen in this area. Highway 101 would likely be inundated for a period of time probably portions of Highlands Lane, that one may be available to us earlier than the other. And it gives us options uh, to get people, uh, to get our vehicles in and out. Uh, 
All right, so I'm going to go back to the cost page. Does that help, uh, Councillor Warren? Yes, it does. Thank you. I think that's helpful for people to see exactly what we're talking about. Thank you. And options are always good. All right, so domestic water system charts, that's the connections uh, from the water main into the building. We're actually bringing the water main up to this site. And then the 8,000 is for connections to that. Fire water system, uh, that is uh, uh, for the, all the connections within and around and including hydrants uh, for that. I think that also may include on that the, yes, that includes also the sprinkler system for the structure itself. That's 79,000. Sanitary sewer system, based on the number of bathrooms and the type of building, we're estimating about 80,000. Storm sewer system. This is to shed water off of the building itself and the roadways. We put an estimate there of about 94,000 to accept the water and not create issues on the dune itself. Electrical services, site lighting, and a generator diesel fuel tank is something we've always uh, made sure that was included in this. And that's a generator capable of powering this location. The diesel tank uh, could keep us going for approximately two weeks if we do things correctly. And the reason we chose diesel over natural gas is in the event of some sort of calamity, uh, it's more easily supplied. Whereas if we did have a large earthquake and we saw separation of gas mains, um, then that generator would work as well. We have a similar diesel generator at the water treatment facility as well. So the hard cost for the building site construction, about 6.43 million. That's what May I ask a question, Chad? Yes, please, sir. Um, I see under paving, you've got uh, 195,000 four inches over 12 inch base rock for 26,000 square feet, but the two streets, um, the potential two streets are almost 50,000 square feet. And then I don't see any cost for asphalt for them. All I see is base rock and fill. So are we looking at a $400,000 asphalt job that uh, is not on this? Uh, that's a great question, thank you. Now, if you look at the east vehicular access road, the north vehicular access road, there's a description on the far right that shows excavation and AC is asphalt, base rock, fill, lights, landscape, wetland mitigation on one side, and on the other excavation, asphalt, base rock, fill, some lights and some landscape. Okay, so the AC means asphalt covering or? Yeah. It's not a company? No, correct. Okay, thank you. Thank you for asking. Uh, so 6.43 for the harder costs. That's the building, asphalt, roadways all together. The next is some of the markups for the harder costs. So between now and when we actually do the finalized design, the design for a situation such as this is expensive. And so we have not done a full design of the building, as you can see by what we provided you. We've gone off uh, the cost consultants, what they know and what the uh, architects, the two architect, one firm and the single architect we were using at, we came up with a contingency. The 20% contingency is high. It's built a little extra high because we don't know everything about this building and its site and the building construction of the roads. We know quite a bit, but we don't know everything. Also, 
you know, some slight changes. There might be areas where we have to go a little deeper on the foundation, a little bit more shallow on the foundation, and that sort of thing. So the design estimate contingencies built to absorb those things. There will, you know, there will be things that we did not perceive. But we were confident in that this would cover it. We're very confident in our contingencies covering all the extras that may happen. The worst case scenario is we get into this project and we find out it's not enough. And that was something that we discussed in every phase of this design portion of it with the engineers, with the architects. Uh, and we discussed that we wanted a healthy enough contingency to be able to get this project done and potentially come in under budget. So we also had discussions of potentially lowering this, but we really didn't want to at this point. We want to make sure that this job gets done correctly. The resiliency factor portion of this, the 1.5% was something that Jay Raskin, he is a, uh, uh, out of Cannon Beach in Portland, he's a resiliency expert. And what that $115,000 is set aside for is to design a lot of the uh, utilities, connections, and other various systems a little bit extra so that it, it, it is harder, so that it can either be safe to fail, something that's easily fixed, or something that will not fail at all in the event of a major catastrophe. Seeing as how this is a resilient building and we're trying to build this for you know, a potential evacuation site, we found that we should probably add something there for that resiliency. The general conditions plus 2% coastal is a discussion we had. Being away from the large metropolitan areas, there's going to be a factor of uh, what general contractor is going to come in. This is going to be under prevailing wage. How are they going to get here? Is there going to be a higher expense for that? Is it going to be more shipping uh, as far as materials go? And all of the things that can happen because we're not in the middle of a, um, of a metropolitan area. But that's only 2% of the entire cost. The other 7% is general conditions. That is what we would pay the general contractor to come in, roll out, bring in construction buildings temporarily uh, and to bring in the security fencing to do all of those things that they need to do to do the construction that is built into this. So we just added another 2% to that to bring it to 9%. Insurance is something required. Profit and overhead is our best guess of what the profit and overhead would be for this project for the general uh, contractors and the other subs that we would use. Performance bond, uh, that is something that's optional, but most cities do use a performance bond. And what this does is, let's say the general contractor, for some reason, and this has happened, not very often, but it's happened, goes out of business partway through the project. The performance bond will enable a, another company to come in uh, uh, that will pick up where we left off and the insurance with that bond will cover it. The escalation of 8% for 742,000 is timing. So if we go forward with this November election, what will happen, that will happen in November, 2021. Then in the winter of 22, will be designed between four and six months, getting all the documentation out so that we can go to bidding. And for companies to give them enough time to bid on this project, which will bring us to first quarter 2023, let's say May, April, May, before construction actually starts. This 8% escalation factor of 742,000 covers all the cost increases that we're looking at right now and brings it to the future, the first quarter of 2023. So we're trying to be realistic about what the cost increases are gonna be between now and then. 
Solar green energy is the requirement by the state. We have set aside uh, solar and green energy at 150. And then of course the newer tax, the Oregon gross receipts tax does affect us as well. So that tax goes to the state of Oregon for 57,000. So that adds the markup total to be 3.79 million. So you add those two numbers for the hard costs. And sorry, folks, there's the bottom part there. So the construction total with those things taken into consideration is 10.229. Now we'll move to the other page. At the top, we've entered that amount for total construction cost of 10.229. And then we've gone through some of these other estimations. Uh, this is the architecture and engineering team fees, design and construction, approximately 15% of the project at 1.53 million. Then we go down to permit regulatory. Now, of course, we don't have any SDCs here at this location, but we do have plan review permits and utility agency fees in order to make our connections to get our permits and uh, for the, uh, the building permits that will be involved in this. After that construction phase related, we have construction testing and inspecting. And those range anywhere from concrete testing as it's being poured to make sure it's done correctly to special inspections on the inside for the systems. So we've allocated approximately that amount. And then again, I think that uh, to take care of construction change orders and such, we've set aside 511,000 just in case. Equipment systems, just some basic IT and some AV equipment. This also includes the fixtures inside, cabinetry, some uh, chairs, tables. Cabinetry is actually mostly in the price of the construction, but this also takes care of a lot of the other fixtures that are within this building. So it would be like pile cabinets file cabinets, chairs, some desks, uh, and, and that sort. And thank you, Chi. Bumping up for the public here to see. Other geotechnical engineering, that's further studies that we would do to make sure that uh, everything that we have done is, is correct. And uh, could possibly have, depending on, on uh, what we find coming up soon. So we're gonna do some more geotechnical engineering. Site so surveying is included. The wetlands offset, we talked to various individuals. The roadway that goes to the east is a portion of that is over some wetlands, as is a lot of the access driveways that are on that side of the, uh, the road. And uh, Shamrock Pines Drive, is a good example of that. That went through the same weapons that we're talking about, just a little bit farther to the south. So we've got some ranges of what wetland credits, where we purchase credits through the state, and those credits are used elsewhere to enhance wetlands. And so we've gotten ranges anywhere between thirty-five and fifty thousand dollars for those credits. So we went with the high side on this so far, just in case. Uh, legal, you know, things can happen legally that uh, we might need our attorney for. And insurance and builder's risk again at 102.3. Uh, that's part of the insurance policy uh, package based on all of these things as well. We added an inflation allowance per year, 1% for two years. The overall project contingency line is zero, but we've got other areas that are as a contingency. The first was on the first page for the construction contingency. We've also added a uh, contingency for construction and change order. And after discussions, we decided that because of this site, this location, and what we're looking at so far, that the another contingency was not necessary. So you add that 2.8 million plus 56,000, that brings the total project cost for all of those items up to 13 million, 
What questions do you have so far about construction? Chad, uh, Lily Brown here. Uh, I have a question about um, the, do you have a design build strategy for some of the systems as a me uh, means of cost savings? Uh, that will come, uh, in, and I'm not sure that can run. We, we don't really have an option for uh, public testimony at the moment, but just to answer that, that will come in within the next uh, phase of the construction. And we'll talk about that when it comes down to the bonding and how the bond will work potentially in steps. But um, yeah, we'll do everything we can uh, to realize savings whenever possible. All right, so uh, counselors online, do you have any questions? No. All right. Okay, Jan, any questions? No, I'm good. Other than for the public, at least of you, I know you had some basic design or like visual things, if you will, as to what would set the cost at three hundred fifty dollars a square foot. Meaning, like, is it going to be cedar shingle siding and composition roof, or is it going, you know, vinyl windows, or you know? It, I believe there was some of that thought process. We've seen a little bit in our there was stuff, but is that worth mentioning? Is a public? It is. is. There, I have from ZCS Engineering a narrative of the type of building, the type of construction, how grading is going to be done, sanitary service, domestic water connections, data communications, and all that. And we poured over this. But in that narrative, one of the things that was important is that we realized that this is also in the middle of a residential community. And so similar to what we did with the water treatment facility, when we built that building, we built it in a way that would best take a large building and make it seem as though it's part of the neighborhood. And that is the same kind of treatment that we would do here. Did it add some money for cedar siding and things like that? Yes, it did. It was a little bit more expensive than just party playing or you know, steel siding or what have you. But because this is in the middle of a residential area and it's going to be around the public, we did add a few for uh, siding comp roof, uh, the lighting downward cast and soft, um, the landscaping that will help you know, take away from the size of the building and make it more of a pleasant area. Those are some of the things that were added on you know, as far as a, a price difference between going with a pole barn style, it's still a critical infrastructure building. So there's only so much we can do with the makeup of the, the, the bones, if you will. The exterior did add a little bit. I can't tell you exactly how much that was, but that's something that we plan for from the beginning. Uh, we could save some money and, and probably make it uh, a lot more basic, but I didn't think the cost were, uh, the cost difference would be out of hand. I guess personally, I would rather have it be a visual that is similar to the water treatment plant in that concept of promoting this as you know, something that's appropriate for your art. So I, I understand the design plan. It was a good choice. It'll look like something that belongs in your art, right? Without going over the top, right? I mean, it'll be. Uh, what is more typical building materials around here, which also happens to be good building material for uh, the weather here. All right. So uh, I, have a question. I have a question. So back on this solar and green energy, 150,000, are you going to be putting like solar panels on the roof? Is that what that's going for? That's the intention is to look at solar power for this, which would include all the electrical work uh, that would need it to be. And whether or not it's on the roof or if it's on its own separate uh, uh, stand uh, is kind of, we have options there. But yeah, it could be on the roof and it is solar among other things that we can do. Uh, we'll be looking to the Energy Trust of Oregon to help us with a lot of the design that may see this, some money on the design of this building, uh, taking into account as much in the way of 
um, green energy and that that we can. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Chad, I'd like to follow up on Lulie Brown's question about design build. So the, the traditional method for building is you hire an architect, they design a building, they come up with plans and specs and then hand it over to a builder. Design build is where the architect and the ultimate contractor who's gonna build it work together closely from the get go. And the builder makes suggestions to make it more efficient because some, sometimes ar architects are great uh, artists, but not the greatest in the practical world. So when you have a design build, you can have a great building at lesser cost if they work together earlier on in the process. So I think that's what she was getting at, and I would wholeheartedly agree with that. Thank you for clarifying that. And, and, and again, everything that we can do to save on this, we will. And I think that that's something to be noted. Thank you. Isn't that problematic in, in doing prevailing wage work and bid? We're locked into taking the low bid as long as it looks like they're meeting the parameters of the bid packet. And I, I think design build is problematic from that standpoint. So, what, what traditionally happened? If I can speak, I mean, we, the school went through design build, and design build is a specific process that has to be approved by the council in order to go that method. And that method, the contractor is then responsible for doing uh, bids and quotes and bringing them. And in our case, at the school district, uh, the school district had to approve those and look at the bids and make. The it was through the construction company that the ultimately the consumer client approved those. Um, we looked at all the different criteria and signed off on them. So they provided a way where, with the design build, you were still looking and evaluating at the builders and the cost that came. The, okay. it, it, and, we'll, and we'll look at that, you know, what the changes, you know, and, and being a uh, lowest bidder type situation, we'll, we'll look and see what those challenges are. Yeah, I, I just like to add that uh, vir virtually every government building, every affordable housing project. In, in the country, including Oregon, um, is subject to the prevailing wage and the use design build, uh, the, the design build concept. And, and it's very common and a lot of the larger contractors are used to working under this environment. So it, it's something to ask in the bidding process. Are, are you familiar with design build? And do you have an architect that you prefer working with? Or you can ask your, the architect if they have contractors that they have worked design build projects before. And uh, then, then they can submit their bid. Thank you. Okay. You want to move in then? Sounds like we. All right. So after that, we're looking at the uh, after the pricing uh, contingent land transfer agreement. That is located. There is a memo that says for general allocation bond pricing that looks like this. And I'm going to pull this up here. On the top. After that, there's one, two, third page of And Mr. Watts, are you still online? Yeah. Would you like to talk about this uh, contingent land transfer agreement? 
Yeah, so this has been a, a kind of a long time coming and I appreciate um, uh, Brent's help with this and Chad's as well. We've been having discussions with the um, property owners, both their planner and uh, an attorney involved recently to try and get down to um, something that I guess everyone can live with. The concept is similar to what I shared with you guys a couple months ago. There are two parcels, uh, two portions of the land that would be donated to the city um, for a couple of contingencies. One is that um, the land will be brought into the city's urban growth boundary that would be done via a UGB trade, which we've discussed in the, the past. Um, the, the, they very much would like to see the, um, that's some questions regarding the, the zoning. The trade as is set forth in the Oregon administrative rules requires a zone to zone trade. So the land that's coming out would be R1. So the land coming in would need to be R1. It could not be anything else. The R1 contemplates single family detached um, lots, 10,000 square feet. That is allowed by right under our um, zoning code, our, the R1 zoning code. So that's what they would get. Um, we did make approval of a subdivision, uh, one of the contingencies. Um, there are, um, we, we recognize that as far as the, and I'm going to call them driveways because I need to call them driveways, the driveway to um, Highlands and the driveway to the, um, the uh, highway, we know where the driveway to the highway likely is going to be and it's on the map. Um, there are two separate options for the driveway to um, the, lane uh, that are shown on the map. Um, we've specified that the city gets to select uh, which one it wants um, and that both are noted on, on the second exhibit. So we'll have the flexibility. Uh, our concern with the, the driveway into, the shorter driveway into the neighborhood is it's steeply sloped. And so from an engineering standpoint, it might not be possible. Um, so that's, that's why we have, I'll call it the contingent option, um, which is the one that instead of going uh, south, or excuse me, I guess um, down and, and west, it would instead go, I guess the best way to describe it would be through north through the lots before connecting into the um, into that neighborhood street infrastructure. So that's something that we'll need to determine um, uh, which which route to take. But the good news is we built the flexibility in, so we we can say either um, they're agreeing to support um, both of the. Um, applications for the easement. Again, these driveways would would not be streets. We would not want, uh, it's, the intent is not to have people cutting through these in order to get to a neighborhood street. This is for our fire apparatus and this is these would be for our volunteers. Um, as far as the uh, land trade our, um, or UGB trade, the, the conversations with DLCD staff, and we've had conversations with three different staff members, have been very positive. There is no other obvious place where the UGB would be put other than this. The other areas of the city, uh, the other areas adjacent to our current UGB are either built at what we would term urban levels for septic on the coast or um, due to wetland and other uh, steep slope issues would would not be likely candidates. So all of us feel very likely that this will probably end up being the place that we would put the trade, but um, we've hired Friganese and Associates to uh, do that study. Um, 
they recently have done work in the city of Rockaway Beach to locate emergency um, uh, facilities outside of Rockaway Beach's existing urban growth boundary. This is a slightly less complicated process from that because we actually have UGB that we can trade. But um, they've recently been working with DLCD staff on the coast. So same folks I'll be working with here. And um, that's, that's good news. It will hopefully uh, result in um, added efficiencies uh, in order to get through that process. So if we, if that happens, we will get the property, whether or not um, we get the bonding authorization from our city electors. Our hope would be that we would, but um, you know, if we have to, um, if we if we don't this election, we will have the opportunity to go out in a future election. The other piece is that there are federal grants or a grant program that has already developed an increased interest in resiliency. So um, there's a program called a BRIC grant that would allow um, that would allow um, us to perhaps get federal funds to move a public safety facility. It's structured to move a public safety uh, facility from one uh, level of tsunami inundation zone to a higher um, safety zone. So still within the uh, tsunami inundation, which, which this facility is, uh, it would, this facility we believe from uh, Dr. Jonathan Allen at Degami's um, preliminary research, this would survive in XL, would not be inundated in XL, but is still in the zone. Um, so we might be able to get funds from that program. We have not worked that into our, um, our cost funding. That, but that is why you'll see when you see the ballot title um, that we say up to $13 million in bonds. Because if, if, if we do qualify for that program, that could reduce the amount of bonding that we have to go, uh, that we end up needing to get in order to build this facility. So I guess that's the, um, that's kind of the scenario as it is. We've recently, there have been some special districts that have gone out for bonding um, and it has not been sufficient uh, to build what people were expecting. So we have been very careful um, in our calculations. There, there is a lot, a lot built in to make sure that this will get built um, as, as, P, uh, as the sort of facility that people would expect. And we have some cushion in there uh, to make sure that that can happen absent any other grant funds, uh, federal or state, and absent any other private donations. And we, we also believe that private donations uh, might be a possibility, but we have not built that into um, kind of our, our plan because we don't have those checks in hand at this moment. So again, uh, kind of a few balls in the air. We've got the contingent land uh, deal. Um, that will result to those parcels, whether we get the bonding or not, though ideally we'd get the bonding authorized in the November election. Thank you, Peter. So Peter, I have a question for you. Sure. Let's say that we go out for a $13 million bond mm -hmm. or up to 13 million. Right. And, and then during the building process, we get a lot of financial donations. Let's say up to $2 million in donations. At what point would the $13 million bond go down by 2 million? Or is that possible? And if not, what would we do with the extra 2 million? Well, um, so Chad and I have discussed that, and we've also discussed it with Bond Council that would be, we would be a we would structure it so that amounts could be um, prepaid. But our our goal is that during this kind of planning process, 
that's supposed to happen over the next four to six months, that at that point we would have more accurate information on whether we're going to get the federal funds. Um, this is something, the program, something that Representative uh, Bonamici has discussed with um, city staff and, and I believe some electives as well, and is um, seemed kind of excited about this uh, program. And again, we would kind of do a push to see if people are willing to pledge those private funds during the four to six months after the election so that the amount of bonds that we go out for is as accurate as possible. So if we're authorized for 13, but we might only end up going out for eight or nine because we have those private checks and uh, federal funds in hand. Oh, thank you. And then just to further clarify that a little bit, you know, by, by prepaying, the bonds get uh, more expensive with interest rates. So that means that you can go for the full 13, but if you don't use it, you can give that back. Um, and, and that makes it more expensive for that money. Another option that we have is to look at this as a couple of different, uh, uh, to go out to market twice for bonds. The first one would be to get started to do a lot of the work, uh, such as the, the, the land use, the design, uh, you know, getting in uh, the roads and that sort of thing. And then as we know more, there's a potential where we can then go ahead and finish off. So we'll go out for 13, the first bond, uh, you know, might be just for deals for 10 million, and then we can do the additional 3 million later. That's just for example, I'm not sure exactly where we're at. We're gonna look at the brick grant through FEMA. Uh, I've got a consultant helping us with that, as well as what Peter said. Uh, we have state representatives willing to help us with this as well. Uh, a lot of the information is still coming out about it, but it looks like something that we can do and we'll be prepared to uh, adjust for that. The only caveat to doing two different bond issuances is that, you know, it's like closing costs on a house. You're, we're gonna incur some more closing costs to do two different issues but it might be well worth it. Yeah, and of course there's interest rate risk. If rates go up, then a subsequent bond issue could cost us considerably more than the market rates are today. So it's something we'll pay attention to and we'll have discussions as we come closer, but up to 13 million is what's important. Uh, I just have to ask the same question, I guess a different way, looking for a simple explanation. When you say we go for a $13 million bond, and let's just say nine months from now, we know we're going to get $3 million in brick funding. Let's just throw that out there as a number. We don't know that, but I'm just throwing it out there. Does that mean when we got that funding, we could take that and pay down the bond with that money? Not with the way we currently have it organized. Instead of paying down the bond, what we would initially do in using your $3 million brick grant award is let's say we have a pretty good indication that we may get that uh, brick grant or we are competitive. The first bond issuance we would do to get started and to begin construction would be $10 million. Now we have the ability to get 13, but we'll start with 10. And then we'll begin the construction, the, the design and then the construction, and then get through this brick grant application process. And if we get that $3 million, then we'll stay with 10. We don't have to go to 13. So rather than paying, getting the entire 13 and paying it down, what we're gonna do is only ask for a portion potentially of the available monies. And then if we get the grant, then, then we're, we're good. If we don't get the grant, then the city will have to go out for another bond issuance for the remainder three. And that will bring us up to 13. Okay. So it's a staged approach. It's a little bit more expensive because it's like we're doing two closings on a loan. But it might be prudent and it could save us millions of dollars depending on this grant. We're going to be working with bond council and we're going to be working with um, the financial people in order to make sure that we're doing this as prudently as possible. 
we only we have only found out about you know there are a lot of new federal programs related to resiliency um a lot of the federal infrastructure dollars that Oregon may that Oregon's already seen um and that may see in the future deal with health safety resiliency so it's possible that there are going to be a lot of programs that um are coming online. And so we're gonna try and be as flexible as possible in working with Golgan and, and working with the finance people in order to make sure we're being good stewards of the city's finances. And Senator Johnson is also aware of this project. She's had conversations with city staff. Um, she's you know quite good at finding money um, at, the, at the state level and um, she's, she's been she's um she's made she's been she's been helpful so far in offering her assistance and so we're we'll see that i i think too over the next uh period of time thank you thank you both so just to clarify we're using language in our november bond vote to ask for the larger amount so we don't have to go back to the voters again in nine months to do the subsequent three million. Correct. So okay. what we're, we're asking for voter authorization based on the cost, the total cost, as well as a contingency of approximately 20%. Uh, because again, like everything else, construction costs have been pretty volatile. And so we want to make sure that we want to make sure that uh, we're covered. I, I suspect that there will be some state or federal funds um, that will that could come available, but we can't base our assumptions on the fact that there there will be. Um, you know, we're making promises to our voters that um, that these are the conditions on the ground. Um, these are the reasons why it makes sense to uh, authorize the project. And we're not gonna say we're going to get federal funds even if we think there's a decent chance because it's outside of our control. So again, though, I, I have full trust in, in working with Golgan um, and working with uh, the, the finance people that, that we'll be able to, um, as well as our, uh, Congresswoman and, and state senator that will be able to um, will be able to have an excellent chance of of uh, structuring this um, really well and and making sure that we don't go out for more than than we need. Something that will also help us with that, uh, Madam Mayor and Councilors, is that once we go through an election and if the residents do choose to go forward with this project. That will help us to write grants because the, the governments will see that we have buy-in from the people that are around here. So one may get the other, or at least make it helpful for us to do grant writing. We've been really successful in grant writing over the years for a lot of different things. Um, and so I don't think this is much different than that. And, and they are looking for projects that look just like this because Communities trying to become more resilient and get out of the major part of the tsunami inundation zone and all that is, is a big deal. And it's in all the conversation now. The cultural change has begun to happen. The, the other piece is that a lot of the state money, that whether it's going to courthouses in different counties or what have you, is going to require a local match. Those projects are going to be on, on, the, um, on the ballot in November of this year. Um, and of the, the local uh, bonding for those. And, and of course, we, we would hope that all of those pass um, because we, we want people to have um, great uh, buildings, et cetera. But in the event that they don't, some of them don't pass, that money would be coming back into the, um, back, back to the state. Uh, it's required to be spent by, most of it's required to be spent by 2024. And so they'll be looking, they could be looking for projects to, um, to fund with that money. Uh, and again, we can't rely on that happening. And, but that's another source of uh, funds that might be available. 
And the good news is that if this is passed, we would have a project that's kind of queued up and be able to demonstrate our local match has already been authorized and that we have voter buy-in. Thank you, Peter. We have not. Um, and that narrative was put together by the staff here as a team. And I, I think uh, if you would like, and, and because uh, Councillor Smith is off site, um, and do we have this? Let me make sure that it's on line here. Ten reports. Ms. Christie, where do we have the uh, the memo? Right there, it says the memo. Nailed it. Thank you, ma'am. All right, so I can read through this page if you like, and it'll clear up some of those questions and also just reinforce what we just talked about. So this memo, general obligation bond pricing, uh, this is something we put together, fire police station general obligation bond levy info. So city staff has been working with the financial company DA Davidson to provide an estimated maximum levy rate for the fire police station project. In order to meet the financial needs of the project, an estimated 13 million is needed. The projections represent a premium bond structure with a 20 year level levy rate. So scenario, project amount 13 million, uh, car amount is 11.57 million. We'll go into that here in just a moment. If the city council authorizes the city staff to move forward with submitting to the electors the authorization to issue general obligation bonds in the principal amount of not more than 13 million to finance a new fire police station, it is estimated based on current financial market conditions that the bonds would cost property owners an estimated maximum of $1 5.2 cents per thousand of assessed value per year. In the current market, the $13 million project is anticipated to generate a bond premium, which benefits taxpayers by lowering the total bond par amount and total debt service. Under this financial scenario, the city would be authorized to issue up to 13 million in bonds. However, the city would only issue 11.57 because of an anticipated bond premium. On a home assessed at $300,000, the estimated property tax would increase by $315.60. On a $500,000 home, $526. Property owners would also still be obligated for the already approved water facility general obligation bonds which are through 2031. The city will pursue any outside funding that comes available. And we talked about that. If the bond passes, voters authorize the city up to a specified borrowing amount. However, the amount of issuance can be less. Before the city finalizes the bond sale par amount, it can review the option of potentially reducing the amount of the bond issuance due to receiving outside revenues. The net result would reduce debt service to the property tax owners. The city would also still be authorized to sell the remaining amount if it was ever needed for the purposes stated in the measure approved by the voters. There would be some additional cost of the issuance and some added extra risk that interest rates go up between the two sales. The city will be working to obtain the year 2021 Building Resilient Infrastructure and Community Grant, also known as BRIC. There is a cost share obligation that generally requires 25% non-federal contribution. The application opens up September 30th, 2021 and closes January 28th, 2022. Pre-award selection notices are anticipated to be in the summer of 22. During the application process, the city would evaluate whether or not to lower the par amount of the bond issuance in anticipation of receiving the grant award. If the grant award comes in, 
the city would be obligated to provide a cost share piece on funds, but may not need to issue the full par, mark, par amount of authorized debt. If the grant award does not come in, the city could still sell the remaining issuance amount approved by the voters to complete the project. The city is also obligated to Clatsop County for its proportionate cost of the ballot measure being placed on the November election. Until all election information is certified, total election costs will not be known. However, estimates have been quoted between four and eight thousand dollars. Any questions about that, Madam Mayor? No. Any questions from the council? No. Okay, so this shows the debt service requirements for $13 million. And I'm here on the right hand side of that. I can't center it much, but I can make it bigger. So currently, the first two numbers that are in blue are what we're paying now. Over on this side of the page, we have the year 2019, 2020, 2021. So for our two water bonds, we were paying in 19, $1. Or $1 30.9 cents. 20 was $1.27. 21, $1.24. 21, and then 22, you see the beginning of our cost savings that we just did because of the refinance, you see $1.18. If we go for this bond under the police fire series 2022 geo bond heading, which is in purple, it shows that the cost of the fire station, $13 million, would be a dollar 5.2 cents per thousand. So you see how that affects what we're already paying. You add that to the water bonds, that would bring the cost per thousand into your heart for bonds to $2.19. And that would begin in year 2023. So in 2023, $2.19. 24, $2.13. 25, $2.94. So for three years, our levies would cost an additional amount of money because of the fire station bond. After that, though, one of our water bonds falls off. And that occurs the end of 2025, 2026. At that point, the bond goes for $2.9.4 to $1.45 again, which is similar to what we're paying now. Over time, the principal and interest goes down because we have less interest payments that we're making. We're making more on the principal. And over that time, you see the dollar amount further reduce. Can I answer any questions about that? Here. So essentially for three years, we would see a, a, a cost increase to our taxes. After that, most of that cost increase would come off. Not all. Still a little bit more expensive. We're out back up to $1.45, but it's close. So with the contingent land agreement, and Peter, if you could verify this for me, this is a piece that we need uh, to discuss tonight and in authorization, if the council so desires to allow me, the city administrator, to enter into this land agreement, which is contingent on a lot of things, including this bond, or excuse me, uh, contingent on, on, on what's in here. Yeah, it's not contingent on the bond. Yeah, um, I that, that, sorry. It's contingent upon the UGD transfer, but if, if, the council doesn't want us to proceed with that, then there's really no purpose of going out for the bond because we don't have a site to put the fire station. 
So what city staff is asking is for an authorization to the city administrator to enter into that agreement and that we approve the resolution to move forward with a $13 million bond for the fire police station and the location we've discussed. And so that authorization, do you expect that to just be a consensus? Or do you want a motion, Peter? A motion would be great. I, I move that we instruct the city administrator to execute the agreement with the developer of Gerhardt Cottages for the UGB land swap. I'll second that. For a motion in a second, one by Councilor Warren and one by Councilor Fackrell. Are there any comments or discussion? I, I uh, have a comment, a question. Um, in discussion here. Why hasn't this been uh, signed? Sorry? Because we've been, we've been in negotiations with the ownership group um, as recently as they had this agreement for a long time and we didn't get any comments. We got comments earlier in this week that we were responsive to. And then we realized that the uh, ingress, egress to Highlands Lane needed to be clarified. Um, and so, and that's just based on the engineering that we got back. So those are the reasons why it hasn't been executed yet. Um, we also need your authorization for Chad, Chad. to sign it. Okay, so the motion to uh, and then a little while to authorize a, uh, a bond. We have an agreement. It just hasn't been signed by Chad yet. There's agreement on all material terms of that contract. It just needs to be signed and notarized. But we need council authorization to do that. That is the motion that we're voting on, Carrie. Yes. It's, it's for... It's for Chad to go ahead and sign this agreement. Yeah, and Carrie, the, there were just a few details that needed to be worked out before we could, in good conscience, uh, sign it. And, and now those issues are resolved. So now full steam ahead. Carrie, do you have any other questions? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Rita? Aye. So that was five eyes. I believe so. Any opposed? No. So that authorization carries. Thank you. We're going to move on now to the resolution number 964, Fire and Police Station Bond Measure. Chat, if you want to. So, so this resolution uh, put together by Attorney Peter Watts authorizes the city to file for the uh, November 2nd, 2021 election. And again, the question shall be your heart to show up to 13 million in general obligation bonds for a new fire police station. If the city council authorizes this resolution, then the city staff will file the necessary paperwork to go forward with the November 2 election where the residents and the citizens of Gearhart uh, will then be able to participate in that. Peter, do you have anything to add? No. Um... It's, uh, you know, it's the authorization for the bonds that we would need to construct the um, station. And it's a fairly straightforward uh, ballot title as well as explanatory statement. There is some language that's required to be in there uh, because of state law and, and that's in there um, as far as a disclosure goes. I would like to make the motion that we adopt 
resolution 964 um, sending a bond measure of up to $13 million to so the taxpayers in November. There's been a motion. Uh, and is there a second? I'll second that. And is there any further discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed? Motion carried unanimously. Yeah. Is there a motion to adjourn? I make a motion to adjourn. Somebody? I was going to give somebody else a chance, but if nobody else wants to second that, I will second an adjournment. All those in favor say aye. 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 Thank you so much, everybody. Yep. Good night. Good night. Bye. Keep safe. Good night.